Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. You know, just because I'm horribly behind on something doesn't mean it doesn't have value. And if you're within the sound of my voice, that must mean you are in the seats with once more. As always, my name is Dave Voigt, and I'm the host of this podcast where we sit down with a wide-ranging variety of industry professionals, and we pick their brain about current projects, state of the industry, how they got started, and so very much more in a light and conversational fashion. And if you like how we do things, I'm guessing you do, you're here, uh, you can subscribe to the podcast. You can find us at App, Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Google, basically wherever you find your podcasts. And plus we archive every single one of our episodes over at our In The Seats YouTube channel. So if you can give us a like and subscribe there as well, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, also, you can find us on social media, either on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at either In The Seats. Right, it's podcast one for all sorts of updates, and finally, and I'm a broken record, but I say it a lot. Most importantly, please pay us a visit over at In the Seats, In the Seats.ca, for all the latest and greatest from the world of film, television, basically the moving image at large. Because if we like to watch it and write about it and talk about it, we love it when you come by and read about it and listen about it. So please pay us a visit and stop on by. On this episode, this is going. This is yet another episode in the theme of things I'm horribly behind on, because I did this talk a little while ago, but it's about a documentary which is on CBC Gem now, the the free streaming service. It's an excellent service if you haven't checked it out. And it's called Nike's Big Bet. It's about legendary coach and Nike spokesperson Alberto Salazar and how he pushed the boundaries of track and field and how abusive he was towards his athletes. And... uh, it's really an interesting film, and we had the distinct pleasure of sitting down with uh, director Paul Kemp to uh, talk about the film and just sort of his own history and relationship with track and field and and these sports and so very much more. Um, it was a good talk, so I hope you enjoy it. So please enjoy our talk with Paul and uh, check out Nike's Big Bet on CBC Gem streaming service now. All right. Well, I mean, obviously, just to kick it off, just congratulations on the film. I did get to see it at Hot Docs, so I've seen the long and the short version. Oh, yeah. But I guess my first question for you is, I guess, walk me through, I guess, the story of discovering this story, because it really is a fascinating one. Well, the reason I did the film about Salazar um, was really a deeper story about why I'm fascinated with track and field. I used to be a national level track and field runner. Uh, back at the University of Manitoba. I was a four-year scholarship track guy, and I ran national championships many times. And I had a really uh, interesting moment at one of the national championships when I was running against two Olympians. And we were in a heat trying to make the final. And these guys had both qualified for the Canadian Olympic team. And I thought, okay, I'm with these guys, and I'm going to make it to the final. And I just felt like there was just nothing I could do. (laughs) I trained as hard as I could my whole life. Like I I probably trained harder than those two guys, tell you the truth. Um, And I just, this one moment that the difference between me and them, I wasn't going to be able to bridge that gap. Um, Even if I did everything that Salazar did in my film, (laughs) even if I'm not sure how you're prefacing this, this conversation, but like, it's about uh, the story is about a guy who pushes the limits of everything. And So I've been fascinated with that, but I've also been fascinated just with general talent. And this guy was able to bring the world-class talent and then squeak out that little bit. Um, And so I've been fascinated with that since the early 90s, I guess. And then followed the sport of track and field for the next 20, 25 years. I ran sort of um, ran Boston Marathon, qualified for Boston. I did a lot of local racing in Toronto uh, while I was working as a filmmaker. And then I got into... Uh, bottom line is I, uh, I follow track and field enough that when Salazar was banned from the sport, I was paying attention. Like it, it happened. It was like front page news on all my, on my Twitter feed. Like it just exploded. And I was like, what the hell? This is a guy that I've been fascinated with. I've been, I wouldn't call it, I wouldn't say it was a fanboy of his, but I was very intrigued with his successes. Um, and I was, I was intrigued with his athletes successes and he had taken Mo Farah, who, if your listeners haven't 
know if they don't remember who he is, he was a four time Olympian. But before he joined Salazar, he was kind of a eighth place in the world guy. He was a good British athlete. No one could really, you could see the talent there, but he wasn't kind of reaching his potential. He goes over to Salazar and within two years, he's the Olympic champion, double Olympic champion, and then comes back four years later and does it again. Uh, and it was incredible. And I was, I was amazed that he was able to take a guy like him and, and turn him, you know, just polish it up and to the point where he was a world champ. And what made that happen was, was intriguing to me. And then when you find out that he's been implicated, he gets banned from the sport, but he's, none of his athletes have ever tested positive for a doping test. And they've done literally like thousands of these things. Um, so were they just cheating under the radar was, you know, so I guess I, I got, I'm just coming back to the point. Why would the U S anti-doping agency ban a guy for, well, none of his athletes have ever cheated. So like, how does that work? You know, it's like, it's sort of like, uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to use a good analogy. I don't know. Maybe you could come up with that, but it's like, it's, it's, it's a bizarre, it's a bizarre situation. Um, and so that's what I wanted to look at it. And that, and when it happened, I knew I had never, I've been a filmmaker for many years and I'd never made a film about track and field. And I said, Hey, this is my chance to do an international scope film about this. And so I went at it and spent the next year and a half trying to uncover the question of did he actually do it and i mean it's one of those things where because i mean to get to the level that you got to in track and field is an amazing thing to get to any sort of ranking sort of to be at the olympics is an amazing thing but it's that next it's that extra one percent which always seems to be sort of attainable but in a shifty way in this sport and i'm kind of curious as you were digging in were there anything that kind of surprised you about sort of getting that extra 1% in the sport, because it's always been that sport where it's just about, like you said before, just sort of wringing that extra sort of little bit of juice out of the, out of of the, out of the fruit to sort of, to get to that next level, because it's one of those, like, as you show in the film, there are these things that his athletes did and he did that weren't technically illegal, but they were, deviously brilliant kind of at the same time oh yeah like i mean he i I do a section in the film which is on cbc and it'll be on gem for the rest of the year actually so people can just log on and watch it um the film that you saw uh, dave was the longer film at the hot dogs festival that was an 83 minute version i've done a 44 minute version for cbc so it's tighter um but all the good juicy stuff you just mentioned is in there like the crazy like this guy would have his athletes in light pods. He would have them taking L-carnitine uh, drip injections, which is illegal. It's not illegal. It's legal. Um, it's just an amino acid that you get it out of in meat, but in a concentrated form that he believed that it could help with endurance. So he figured out what the rule was, which was no more than 50 milliliters in a six hour period in a drip. <laughs> I think did 49 milliliters. <laughs> no one's clear, but uh, literally he had these athletes doing these sort of things. Um, he, he pushed it to the limits. Um, he had LG, when he started what was called the Nike organ project, uh, which is the name of the club. Um, it was funded by Nike. He actually had Nike build a house for the athletes and it was an altitude house. And, He's the first person who ever had built an altitude house and he had to go to the local authorities and get the city of Portland to okay that you could build, create a chamber in a house that made it feel like you were living in altitude and then they would come out in the morning and they'd run at sea level because they're in Portland. Well, it's not sea level, but it's not very high. And then so at night they would sleep so that there's a in track and field, it's well known that you sleep high and train low is the best way you could do it because your body adapts to having low oxygen for most of the day. But then you train with oxygen and it, it stresses you. There are some right. people believe you can just run up in the in the mountains and you get benefit, too. But uh, most of most of the new science suggests this. And, and he was on top of this and, and builds a house that's compressed. And he's the first person who ever did it. And it, he created an industry for altitude houses. <laughs> and then he created an, what was called a, an altered G, which is 
well known now actually you can go into like sports medicine places um and you would run in this machine and it basically holds your hips up and it's like it's almost like an air tank thing yeah. and it holds you up so you don't hit your legs down as hard when you're running so the his athletes were not his his whole thing was keep his athletes not injured because injury is the biggest um death knell for any top athlete in running is season you're done if you can stay healthy and still do a lot of, of work you can you can have an incredible career and so his whole thing was keep the athletes healthy so that he had them running like up to 30 40 miles a week in an ultra g which no one had heard of and now of course they're every university program in the states has them they're all over they're in toronto all over toronto um you can get an ultra g um, but that industry didn't exist until Salazar happened. And then he he uh, also uh, was one of the first people to ever try underwater treadmills. Um, he literally put a treadmill in the pool, <laughs> had the athletes up to their chest, and they would run in a treadmill um, so the athletes' legs wouldn't take a hit. And now there's 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 training facilities all over America with all these treadmill pools. And again, these are Salazar's, like Salazar came up with this stuff. He was the first guy to use them to try and get his athletes to the next level and everyone's copying them. So I think there's been, he, he did get some advantages from it. And a lot of his athletes seem to, um, to benefit from it. So yeah, like, I mean, he's, he's a wild man. <laughs> and I mean, it's crazy because when you see some of these things sort of on the surface, they seem silly, but in, they've worked so incredibly well and i mean i think something that your film really does highlight very well without sort of being overt about it at least uh just because like when it comes to track and field and all these kind of olympic sports people think of them as amateur sports but and they are amateur sports but obviously when you're winning money comes into play like if you're in eighth place there isn't necessarily quote unquote money opportunities but if you're get, if you're meddling all the time and you're winning then there is money the money opportunities i'm kind of curious from your perspective do you think maybe that's why salazar got banned because it did at least kind of highlight the fact that no people are making money off this because they're winning no i don't think that i i don't like comparing a runner like a top runner like Mo Farah, like at the top. I mean, he was Britain's athlete of the year twice right. um, in all of Britain, like across the soccer players. But compare his salary to what a, a top soccer player would make would be. Peanuts. Oh, no, obvious. Yeah, 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 yeah. So he but he but he still comes in. He would still be making several million pounds a year be, with his Nike contract and with bonuses, plus all of his endorsements. Um, you know, he's a, he's a wealthy man. I mean, oh, he's yeah. not hurting, but he's, um, but to compare it. Yeah. Like, Oh no, comparatively, uh, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and Nike, of course, it's bread and butter is track and field. It started as a track and field company. Phil Knight was a, was an athlete who ran and uh, for Bill Bowerman and Bill Bowerman was the guy who created the waffle trainer. Anyone who's old enough will remember the waffle trainer at the bottom of your shoe. If you're over the age of 40, you remember this. You're like, hey, I, I'm over. I 50, remember it. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the waffle trainer was like ubiquitous. It was everywhere in the 80s. And that he created that on a waffle iron in his backyard. Like, this is how small Nike was. It was like a little company um, that started in, in, in Portland and then in, actually, I think it was in Eugene, they started, uh, no, it was in Portland, sorry, in Beaverton. And um, they basically started in the 1960s and built this thing up. And it's now by far the biggest running, well, it's the biggest sports brand in the world. It's not even actually close. Um, they sell close to 65% of all shoes in the world. Um, of all shoes like that is insane like thinking about that i think adidas is number two with 25 percent. like that's the kind of scale we're talking about um in nike so they have a lot of weight and running with so when they backed this program they did throw mon money at it and I'm, I'm coming a long way here to get back to your question like did they ban them for the money i don't think so i think they banned salazar like they paid him well, Nike paid him well. He was well regarded. His athletes were doing better than most. Uh, he had national champions. He had Olympic champions. <clears throat> but I think they, they <clears throat> he was known as a very, his athletes loved him, 
but he was also known as a tough character to like. Right. Um, a lot of people in the sport dislike him. And to this day, like people have seen my film and I've gone on some of the running, <clears throat> the, sorry, I got a thing on my no. throat. Um, uh, the, in the running chat boards, they'll talk about him and, and it's just the hatred just comes out. Like this guy's this, he's, he's been a cheater since the eighties, since he was an athlete. Like they'll help throw out all these malicious um, statements about him with no backing, of course. Like there's no like evidence um, that he was, uh, like a rabid doper in the eighties. No one's come forward to ever suggest that. And he never failed tests while well, they weren't testing much in the eighties. Um, as an athlete, he was a world champion, a world record holder, uh, in the marathon in, in 1981. So, I mean, that's how good of a runner he was. So, but he had, he had earned, um, a reputation even around his, his competitors said he was a jerk. <laughs> so, uh, I think part of that, like that, if you live your life being known as a hard to deal with person, I don't think people look as fondly as, as the nice guy. Um, so that might've led to it, but I think deep down two of his athletes went to the U S anti-doping agency and said that they were not pleased with some of the things they saw in the club. And what they saw was him creating what were, um, they're called cues. They're like therapeutic use exemptions. They're legal. You can go and legally go to the anti-doping agency and say, my athlete's got an issue and he needs asthma at medication or needs some sort of thyroid medication. He did this a lot. So he always cleared it. He was always on the legal side of it, but it was always like, really do all these athletes need asthma medication? Oh, and, and there was this like a a story of him like having his athletes run up the stairs so that he could induce this sort of feeling like before right. they did the test. Um, and this is one of the things he got in trouble for was he was trying to manip manipulate the tests so that he could get the exemptions to do the legal thing. Uh, and so when you're doing that, you're pushing the limit, you're staying on this side of the line, but oh, no one really likes to, to think about that. You know, it's kind of, and using thyroid medications and he did give, um, it's well known that, um, he would give like a scoop of this powder to his athletes after the workout <laughs> to this day, nobody knows what they're taking. <laughs> like, and there's several athletes who said it, none of them passed like failed tests. So it was probably legal, but we don't know. Like, was it protein powder? Or was it like, he just said like, and the athletes trusted him so much. They, I think some of them just felt so bad that they did go to the USADA saying, I do not like what I had to go through in this situation. So I don't think, I don't think he was banned for the wrong reasons, really. Like, I, I, I think he was, he was banned for technical breaking, breaking three technical rules. And they were rubbing tes testosterone cream on his son because he believed, <laughs> and you can take this as you like, he believed that some other coaches might manipulate and sabotage his athletes like Ben Johnson in 19, right, you know, right. in 1988, that's what he believed. So he was rubbing testosterone cream on his son and he admits it to the U S anti-doping agency <laughs> and says, I wanted to test how much testosterone cream could go in <laughs> without like getting busted for a testosterone test. And as Alex Hutchison it in the film says, he goes, yeah, that's one way of looking at, it. or he wanted to know how much testosterone cream he could rub on his athletes. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I present this in the film. So yeah, like, I mean, these are little things. He was skating up to the limit and I think, you know, did they get it right? Probably. I mean, yeah. I mean, they probably, he pushed the limits of what was supposed to happen what is weird is i don't think his athletes were taking doses of massive doses of testosterone or, or erythropoietin which is called epo it's like a blood enhancer i don't think they were doing that um i really don't and i don't i've never no athlete has ever come forward saying that they did that um they've i mean to a point they would implicate themselves if they did so so i mean that's the thing that is always leading at the background is if you're gonna if you're gonna implicate the coach you implicate yourself um so Salazar has that on his side because those athletes never these are world champions they're never yeah. going to come forward and say well you know I was taking this cream and you know none of them would ever do that so I think they got it right I don't I don't think I think it was just hatred of him and, and disdain for him 
and the fact that he did some things that got him banned i uh, i'm not so sure it was like the money and all that stuff is is now i mean it, it's fascinating to me because i mean in watching it and i mean as for you as a veteran of the sport itself i think one of the things that really shocked me was sort of how much people wanted to sort of uphold the tradition of the sport and i'm kind of curious as you were sort of going into sort of all these issues is there anything that surprised you that maybe caught you off guard well the, the biggest thing was right when we were doing this the the new nike shoe um came out um the nike vaporfly shoe and it's called the alpha fly you can buy them at the store now uh but when this sort of was breaking that shoe um has now been proven to to increase well for certain athletes up to five to six percent more efficient uh they'll uh, efficiency gains they will get um that's huge in the marathon we've seen the marathon records just be smashed in the last three or four years um since these shoes came out so that's that's the big thing that i've noticed that let nike athletes jump the gun so if you had those shoes because they released prototypes prior to them doing the mass release and if the prototype goes on a nike athlete and you're in adidas or saucony or on running or whoever whatever running shoe you wear hoka you're behind the eight ball like you're gonna lose and that shoe itself i think has done more to separate the wheat from the chaff on cheating <laughs> i don't know i don't want to call it cheating it's like mechanical doping i guess well, you're right exactly it's engineering yeah. it's not yeah 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 so I, but that's, and I make that point in the film that the, the marginal gains, once the shoes, like once everyone's wearing the shoes, it's a, it's an even playing field again, right? Exactly. So what we've had is a breaking of every world record in the distances. Almost every record has gone in the last year, about a year and a year and a half, everyone. And now, but now all the other athletes have the shoes. So now it's an even playing field again, right? And this is where the Salazar comes in and he can, he can come back to like he can come back to well we'll see if he, he's allowed to come back now in 2023 so we'll see if he if he comes back to the sport but he's been banned for four years so he's in, he's finished two years of his banning and he just i don't know if you saw it yet yeah, just yesterday he was uh the court of arbitration for sport in switzerland uh upheld the ruling and he's still banned they yeah. didn't overturn it so he's he's still out um but getting back to your question about tradition yeah like i mean yeah, there's purists out there. I mean, there's guys, I know a couple of people say like, I will never wear these new shoes. I think they're going to change their opinion as soon as they can't compete. Like when they're running a 5k in the local race and <laughs> the guy that they beat two weeks ago is wearing those shoes and is now 30 seconds in front of them. Like you're going to wear the shoe. <laughs> so, so tradition can get, we can talk about tradition, but it gets thrown out the window. I think I, you know, and I, let, let's be honest like if if i had that shoe in 19 when i was still competing like at a high level in 1991 or whatever i would have worn that shoe yeah. <laughs> so yeah i still ran like even i ran boston just five years ago yeah that that marathon it probably would have helped me by five minutes in the marathon would wow. i have worn it yeah of course yeah like for sure yeah it, it's just amazing to see sort of how chemistry on one end is bad but physics on the other end is good <laughs> yeah. when it comes to this sport and really how they're really kind of colliding just as more as sort of the science of it all advances actually i kind of like that i'm going to use that uh, line actually <laughs> yeah please <laughs> it is true it's like physics you're right it's um but i guess everyone has access to the physics the chemistry was there's a difference between the coaches and the purest coaches and but i mean again there's 20 ways to coach an athlete and some some guys do super high mileage like 150 miles a week um, yeah. you know it's like 200 that's 250 kilometers a week some guys are running uh reed cool said and and uh, he's managed he's two-time canadian olympian um he he was running 250 kilometers i remember seeing his training logs just going this is crazy like Doing 200, like imagine just your average listener here saying run 250 kilometers in one week and doing that week after week after week. Like that's how strong these guys get. And so you do need to recover. You do need a coach that understands that. You need to get in the pool. The underwater treadmill, if you can run 40 or 50 of those miles on 
with not slamming your legs into a concrete surface in a downtown Toronto, <laughs> yeah, you're probably like, you're probably going to like recover better. And so, yeah, these, you know, that's where I think every coach and athlete is trying to figure out the way to get there. Um, so tradition, yeah, we can talk about the old tradition. Like, what are we going to get back to? Like chariots of fire running and bare feet and, uh, <laughs> I, mean, I, can't, I can't fathom running that much in a year most people well, i got up to like the most i ever got up to i ran i ran four weeks in a row i ran over 100 miles so i don't know what that is 160 kilometers that's something about like that yeah yeah something like that like i did 100 like it's 15 miles a day right like yeah like my legs the first week goes no problem by the time i got to the fourth week i could barely walk like it, it it builds up in your legs and i i'm not even close to what a lot of the like the top runners, even in Canada are, are doing. Um, so this is a, it's a tough sport and you have sure. to get used to like the pounding and, and it's, it's really about recovery uh, more than just training. And if you can make yourself recover faster and, and that's what Salazar was amazing at. That's what, what he tried to do. Now, I mean, just to shift gears a little bit. And I mean, this is something I always like to ask, like, I'm kind of curious what got you off the track and behind sort of a camera, because it's not necessarily a straight line to go from, you know, university class olympic class runner to filmmaker yeah well i wasn't olympic class i was national class like i i went to olympic course, trials and course. like stuff like that yeah like it was good like it was good enough to like i came as a junior as fourth in the country and you know in the 800 meters nothing to um, off at sir yeah like i was good but i wasn't and i got it i don't know i just i think when i was 22 23 i just realized I'm not going to make a career of this thing. I am good, but I'm not great. Like I'm really good, but I'm not great, great. And that's the difference. And if you can be great, great, you've got 10 years, you can make yeah. a living doing that. And, you, but even if you're like at that peak level, very few, I would say only a handful of people in Canada, like maybe well, I mean, obviously there's Andre Grass and Aaron Brown in the sprints and there's, you know, some of the, uh, you know, we've got a couple of pole vaulters that are world-class. We have like, some of those people are, are actually making a living, but like DeGrasse is, is wealthy, wealthy. Um, but, and, and Damian Warner will be wealthy, wealthy. Um, but other than those two guys, like, I mean, who's really yeah. making a huge amount of money doing this. True. Yeah. So I basically kept up with it. I love running. I like being in shape. I, I run, I just got back from an AK run just now. And, uh, so I run every morning and I, it's a lifestyle for me more than anything, but I just realized, you know, I'm not going to make a living at this. So I got into student politics and that it's a long story, but I ended up in a film, uh, in a film and a guy cast me for a documentary in 1994. Um, it was a journey across Canada, the kind of thing. It was just for a small broadcaster uh, in Canada and it went on PBS in the States. And so I, I, I learned how to be in a film and how to actually not, I thought the director was kind of <laughs> sketchy. Fair enough. I didn't really, well, I didn't really like, I, I have this, is this really how you do this? And so I learned how to do it. And by the 99, by 1999, I was doing full films for global TV. And, um, and then it's just, it's 20 years later, um, all of a sudden I've done, you know, 20 films and, hundred like about 125 screen credits for tv shows so i do a lot of tv shows and films and i just fell into it and i i again i've never done anything in sports at all like zero sports um i, I did a show um called transformer about the world's strongest man turning into a woman yes um, that, yeah from the house yeah one hot dogs three years ago it's on netflix in the states it's on it's on cbc you can watch it now it's actually a very interesting film but that was about uh a weightlifter bodybuilder so that was the closest to sport i've actually done um i did a bruce i did a show on bruce MacArthur, serial killer um story for cbc called village of the missing a couple of years ago um i've done a series called i did a show called the science of sin that's selling <laughs> around the world and I, I like i do tv shows like think discovery channel right um yeah that kind of stuff nature of things i and, and but my love is feature documentaries like i just love them and we're in a we're in a great point of my career because like netflix showtime uh hulu amazon they're all buying um these shows and they're they're desperate for good documentaries and i'm glad i'm trying to make them 
I don't know if we'll do another sports one though. Like I, I, I maybe um, a couple of people have approached me, but uh, we'll see. Well, I, I mean, I think you should because I mean, honestly, I could see this going in sort of a you know ESPN thirty for thirty kind of thing. I mean, I think it fits well, and I mean, it's such a fascinating story to just to that gives us really a look inside the world of, of, of track and field and just sort of, I guess, sort of the machinations inside it is probably the best way to word it. Because I mean, I think it goes back to my chemistry versus physics line that, you know, it's really a fascinating thing to see them sort of collide and fight each other as science evolves and as the sport evolves. Well, the, um, in the States, I got an interesting ESPN story. I don't know how much time you you do it. No, please. Okay. I I got it. Um, so ESPN, I had sold this. It's actually sold in 82 countries right now. So it's picked up. Uh, Sky UK is the biggest sports pay uh, station in, in Britain. Yeah. And uh, they picked it up. They were one of the commissioners with CBC and the German national broadcasters at DF, actually. So that's how I financed the thing. Um, but I tried to sell this into the States uh, for a while. And then we, it was weird. ESPN said no. So they were at the Hot Dogs Festival. And I... I had them watch it and they agreed to watch it because they knew it was the only, one of the only sports films that was at hot dogs this mm. year and one of the top guys was at the hot dogs festival oh well he was he was a delegate so he watches it and he immediately says hey let's do a call and i think okay great like i'm gonna get an espn sale here like 30 because i love 30 for 30 it's oh like, yeah okay, it's like great. so yeah. good and basically he said like we love this um but we really would want salazar in the film we want more of a, 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 a sliver in time story. Um, they, they like to do like Gooden versus like they're doing the Doc Gooden and Daryl Strawberry the year of right, that. Right. Like, they like to do, I don't know if you've watched them, but they're very interesting in how they speak about the shows they do. They really just try and take a slice, like one year in the life of the team or um, obviously they do the Michael Jordan thing, but um, which is a longer series, but they oh, yeah, right. they're like really looking event, for a moment. Yeah. Yeah. For a feature film, they're really looking for feature film type stuff that can go in festivals. So anyway, I did I did have a long chat with them, and they really enjoyed the film. Um, they said like it's great storytelling, and they, they actually had gone through my. What I found interesting about the guys down there was that they said they went through my. They were more interested in the stuff I did that wasn't in film in sports. They wanted to see my other films, so. They're, they're looking for filmmakers that are doing films that can tell a story, an epic story that somebody who's not maybe 100% into sports can still watch the film and just be in oh, Okay, okay. And that's what they want. So I'm pitching them. Uh, actually, I can't say it right now, but I have one idea. You're pitching idea. them. I like it. <laughs> so I pitched them 10 ideas and they said, no, no, no. And then I, but I started to, they, they, uh, after nine, I came up with one and he go, he goes, if you can get this guy to agree, you got it. And uh, so, I don't know, I'm, I'm trying to work that right now. So I can't tell you what it's called, but it's a great, it's a great, it's a great sports story. Um, but I'm not working on one right now. So if, if I can get this guy to agree to be in the, in the film, um, I, I can't even tell you, I'm not going to tell you what sport, but uh, it's, it's a great sports story. And I think most people would know it. Uh, so Anyway, I'm I'm fascinated with that stuff. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna keep my ear open. Like if I can get these stories, um, I would have left. Uh, there was a film on Ben Johnson nine nine point seven nine. I don't yeah. know if you ever saw it. Such a good film, and uh, I thought it was great. Um, I also thought the Donovan Bailey story on um, that's on, that's streaming on Crave right now. It's pretty good. Um, yeah. yeah, it's a really good story about 1996 and like how he came basically he overcame that injury to win the gold medal. So I, I, yeah, those sliver time stories are the best ones where you can get characters to, to regale, you know, you with like the, the craziness behind the scenes and, and, but you need the conflict, like the whole thing about sport is conflict. And that's why sports so compelling is, you know, that's what I, I love that. And that makes good films. So that also makes, you know, that's what. So my ears are open. I'm not a hockey guy. Like I wouldn't do a sport. Uh, I don't think I would do a hockey thing. I, I used to play <laughs> high yeah. level hockey in Winnipeg when I was a kid, but I, uh, I, hockey's not my, I wouldn't go for that. I don't think. Um, but I, I am interested in the, the Olympic sports, a lot of the Olympic sports. And I'm interested in like the people that transcend them. Um, 
the crazy stories behind the scenes. I love that stuff. So well, keep your ears open, man. And you know what? Thank you for the time today. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, well, if you ever come up with a good idea, you know where to find it. <laughs> <I'll>, yeah, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> I'll try and sell it for you. And we could you could be an executive producer. I right? love it. Excellent. Thanks, man. <laughs> And don't forget to to visit our friends over at Bay Street Video for all your DVD, Blu-ray rental or purchasing needs this summer as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well. Over at 1172 Bay Street, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you can give them a call at 416-964-9088. That's 416-964-9088. Or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your DVD and Blu-ray needs.